Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022, uh, the 2022 AFUBA AAS Homecoming Lecture. My name is Corey Walker. I'm the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities and Director of the Program in African American Studies. On behalf of our intellectual community here at Wake Forest, I want to welcome all of our Wake Forest alumni to this event, which kicks off AFUBA's Homecoming Celebration homecoming celebrations this week. We started this program last year with our first lecture that discussed African American, the African American student movement here at Wake Forest. And this year I'm delighted to welcome our newest faculty member in the program of African American studies, uh, Dr. Shanna Benjamin. She's truly a distinguished scholar and today's conversation uh, on Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Benjamin's work will be a gift for all of us. And we are truly delighted that she has joined the Wake Forest community as professor of African-American studies. Uh, she brings a distinguished background to the university. And more importantly, uh, she, is true, she truly embodies the ideal of the teacher scholar. As Boy introduced introducing Dr. Benjamin, I want to open up with uh, a reading from her latest work, Half Life in Shadow, The Life and Legacy of Nellie McKay. In this text, Dr. Benjamin writes, Half in Shadow reclaims McKay's story, her past and her purpose to establish her place in a genealogy that maps Black women's intellectual, intellectual influence across generations. McKay exists as part of what Audre Lorde and the Cancer Journals called a continuum of women's work in which the act of reclaiming this earth and our power continues beyond death. A distinguished scholar, teacher, and academic leader, Dr. Shanna Green Benjamin is a scholar of African-American literature, literary criticism, and literary studies. She has developed a robust body of scholarship grounded in African-American literary studies while contributing to such desperate fields as Black studies, Black feminist studies, and gender and sexuality studies. She has leveraged her scholarly insights to inform and advance a unique model of academic leadership that contributes a distinctive voice and vision to the university and to the profession. Prior to joining the faculty at Wake Forest University, Dr. Benjamin was a tenured full professor at Grinnell College in English, and she served as associate dean of the college at, at Grinnell, which is one of the nation's premier national liberal arts uh, colleges. Her scholarly writings have found a broad audience in the academy, and her articles have appeared in such important venues as African American Review, the CLA Journal, Meridians, as well as in Studies in American Fiction. She has received a number of awards to support her scholarship. Most recently, she received a Howard Foundation Fellowship and an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship. Dr. Benjamin's scholarship combines the best of deep thinking, patient development, and continuous and sustained contributions to the academy. Her monograph, Half in Shadow, The Life and Legacy of Nellie Y. McKay, announces her unique invitation to engage African-American women's biography and American intellectual life. Her focus on the pioneer scholar Nellie Y. McKay advances a novel perspective on the cultural, intellectual, social, and political forces that shape and inform a scholar's intellectual vocation and academic identity. Moreover, Dr. Benjamin develops a critical archival practice in recovering the underexamined history of African-American women scholars in a rapidly transforming university. In so doing, she really expands the boundaries of American and African-American literary history and rendering a textured portrait 
of how African-American women negotiate the complexities of gender, race, and nation, as well as the contentious politics of knowledge production in the American Academy. This critical biography opens new horizons for exploring African-American literary studies, African-American studies, and Black feminist studies. As one scholar writes, half in shadow is so thoroughly and careful in, in the ways it so thoroughly and carefully outlines McKay's legacy, also secures Dr. Benjamin's own stature as a premier scholar in the fields of African-American studies and Black literary studies, as it simultaneously points to Dr. Benjamin's ongoing commitment to the development and investment in those fields via close examination of one of its founding lights. The book has been widely reviewed and is a nominee for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award in Fiction for Memoir and Biography. Please join me in welcoming my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Shannon Benjamin. Oh, Corey, thank you so much for that generous introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and can't wait to get going with our conversation. Well, I've given sort of the professional overview of Dr. Benjamin, but you have a really unique story and con deep connection to North Carolina. Um, tell us who Shanna Benjamin is uh, yeah. and how did we get to the place where we were able to really recruit you and have you join the faculty here at Wake Forest University? Yes, well, um, yeah, thank you for that. So I started um, as an undergraduate at Johnson C. Smith, right up the road. Um, and I was there, uh, goodness, in the 1990s. And it was a really exciting time to be at an HBCU. I, when I think about popular culture and I think about a different world and I think about um, school days and I just think about the ways in which HBCUs were being, I think, elevated and revered and acknowledged in ways that were unique for the time. It was really exciting to be on campus and when I became a student at Johnson C. Smith, I also became a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow. At the time there were, um, it was called the Mellon uh, Minority Undergraduate Fellowship Program. And the goal was to create a pipeline of scholars who would transform the professoriate. So you develop undergraduate researchers and then they go on to graduate school and pursue a career in college teaching. So I, did the program, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for graduate school, and that's where I met Nellie Y. McKay. I was doing research as an undergrad on Toni Morrison and came across her name in the process of writing an annotated bibliography, McKay's name, of course, in the process of um, compiling this annotated bibliography on Morrison. So I knew about her, and when I got to Madison, that's when I started working closely with her. And so I was there um, for my graduate work, but then I returned to Johnson C. Smith to teach and to direct the Honors College there. So I was actually there for about 10 years um, because the reason I entered the professoriate was to impact students who look like me. I knew what my experience looked like as an undergraduate at JCSU. And I really just wanted to be someone who the students could look to and um, be inspired, not because of anything that I had done individually, but maybe because of what I represented in terms of a long history of um, black women in the academy achieving and striving and, um, and really lifting as we climb. So, um, I was back at Smith and then ended up at Grinnell, as you mentioned, and returned to the area after being gone for a while for a lot of the reasons that folks um, returned home. And even though I was born and raised in New Jersey, I consider North Carolina to be home because this is where 
Um, my family is, my family's close by, um, extended friends, colleagues, and all of those relationships. So it was by returning home that um, I was met with the opportunity to join the faculty and really return to Black studies. Um, my MA is in Black studies, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been in English departments. So it's just really an exciting time, I think, at Wake Forest for Black Studies, as I also see what was once um, shrinking resources around Black Studies and Cultural Studies programs really shifting um, and institutions investing more in recognizing the value of having um, programs that center the lives and the cultures of um, individuals of African descent. Well, Shanna, we're so excited to have you here. You really bring you know, Black studies to life, not only with your scholarship, but your commitment and passion. And in many ways, this text, uh, Half in Shadow, The Life of Nellie McKay, um, this is an exemplary text that really uh, articulates the central aims of Black studies and that intellectual tradition. Tell us a bit about this book. Um, how did it come about? I mean, you, you, you were a student of Nellie McKay, but being a student and then writing uh, the, the first full length uh, scholarly uh, biography of her, there, that's a big leap. Yeah. Um, it was. It's interesting because I started the project probably around 2009, 2010. Um, so I started it shortly after I joined the faculty at Grinnell. And McKay had, uh, McKay had passed in 2006. And um, Nellie Y. McKay was the co-editor of the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature. So when I was a graduate student at UW-Madison, I knew who she was, but I didn't really, I didn't really know who she was. She told us this story about, um, you know, being famous and, um, you know, we laughed. I was in her graduate seminar. And I just had, I don't think I had an appreciation, this came much later, um, an appreciation of all she had done and was in the process of doing for um, Black studies, African-American literature and Black feminist thought. So um, I was her graduate student, but once I left and after she had passed, you know, we were grieving and it was just, it was an awful time because um, when McKay passed, there had been this spate of death among black women um, who were artists, who were scholars, who were writers. Um, and it just felt like this, this epidemic one after the other. I'm not gonna get them in chronological order, um, but I remember Claudia Tate and June Jordan, um, Tony Cade, Bambara, um, Shirley Ann Williams. Um, the list just went on and on. And when McKay passed, we thought, oh, you know, here it is, another example of the toxicity of the American Academy and the kind of real effects it has on Black women scholars. Well, um, we put her in that category of women who had died young, I, and by young, I mean in their 50s, um, women who had died of cancer. But soon after, I learned that um, she didn't quite fit those categories. Even though um, throughout our relationship, she called me and other Black women, um, graduate students, her daughters, we thought she was unmarried. We thought she had no children. Um, when we learned after her death that she had in fact been married, she was a divorced single mother of two. And the woman that we had come to know as her sister was actually her daughter. 
So it was in light of all of this information, and I'm just having a conversation with a colleague of mine, Jean Jarrett, who's now at Princeton. And I'm telling Jean this story, and Jean says, you know, you should write about that. And it was after our conversation and work with a, um, a women's scholarly writing group at Grinnell. I had colleagues there um, who I bounced the idea off of and they said, oh gosh, absolutely. You should write about this. So that was the beginning. I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea, but I had no idea what I was getting into. I also had no idea how to write a biography. Um, I had done um, what would be kind of traditional literary criticism, but I think I've always had an ear and an interest in oral history and talking to my elders and sort of writing stories out of those experiences. And so I came to McKay's story with um, not a lot of experience, but actually all of the tools that I needed to write her story. And it was just a matter of thinking back to the broad interdisciplinary grounding that I got as a master's student in African-American studies, where I was taking courses in history, where I was taking courses in art, where I was taking courses in literature, where I was in an archive, where I was thinking about how one translates primary documents into a narrative and how to imagine a time and place in order to situate a reader. So it just, you know, it was overwhelming at first, but once I got into the process, I realized that my training had actually prepared me in ways that I hadn't fully recognized because I put a lot of those skills on the back burner because I was in a strictly English department. Um, and so writing the book just gave me an opportunity to do all of the things that I love. Um, but most of all, to elevate and to animate the story of a woman whose impact on the field, I think, um, was not fully acknowledged or recognized at the time. And I also thought that the book would stand as um, a reference point for future work, other scholars who were interested in documenting what it took to institutionalize not just Black studies, but also Black literary studies. Well, tell us a bit about that. Tell us a, a, a bit about Nellie McKay's uh, intellectual formation. You, you sort of set, shed light on this uh, background that we didn't know about, uh, this background of she she had a daughter that we thought was a sister. She she wasn't married, but she had been married. Um, seems like she had a very interesting journey to becoming the Nellie McKay uh, of her later life. Talk to us a bit about her uh, formation. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, but I don't think that it's unlike the narratives of a lot of women who make choices to raise their children or to work or to care for um, a sibling's children, nieces and nephews, all of the kind of um, commitments that go beyond a focus on one's personal aspirations. When those things um, take precedent and become more prominent than the pursuit of individual goals and dreams, I think that her story is really quite representative. So she um, she had her children in her 20s and she had them one after the other and they were actually raised in Jamaica. So they were raised in Jamaica and she came back to the States. So she was a first generation, first generation Caribbean woman. Um, her father was from Jamaica. And um, there, you know, once she came to the States, you know, she focused on working and on contributing to the household, to her father's household. Her mother um, 
passed when she was very, very young. And one of um, the interesting parts that we, you know, we can talk about a little bit later has to do with the way that she narrates her um, her mother and kind of recreates this story about um, how she came to be um, invested in literature as a result of the imprint placed on her by her parents. So, okay, we can put that aside. But anyway, so, you know, she's working, she's got this job at a warehouse and um, eventually her children are sent back to her and they join her in her father's house in Queens. Hmm. And she's working there and, you know, it's not fulfilling work at all. And she's working with this, you know, really kind of sexist manager who thinks, you know, well, you know, you don't need to go back to school. You'll be this bumper secretary. And she thinks, well, I don't want to be a bumper secretary. I want something else. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, she had a pastor and this was a white guy. So a pastor at a Presbyterian church at Hollis Presbyterian Church in Queens who had, um, he was, he came from the Pacific Northwest, but he was at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, if I'm recalling um, the name, correct me, feel free to um, um, adjust that for me, Corey. But he, he was, he came through Princeton and landed at um, Hollis Presbyterian. And he saw potential in McKay. She was active in Christian education um, and was best of friends with his wife, Joyce Scott. So we're talking about Donald Scott here, who was pastor of the church. And so he saw potential in her. And there was a new program called SEEK. And um, this was a program, another one of those pipeline programs that was geared toward diversifying the city of New York, um, the CUNY system, so that there would be more Blacks and Puerto Rican students there. It was, you know, it was skewed white. And so they knew that there was an access problem. They knew that there was a resource problem. They knew that Black and Puerto Rican students were overwhelmingly in these underfunded and under-resourced public schools. And so they needed to figure out a way to have a more representative um, body of students um, than they had at present. So she entered as a, um, as a returning student. So she was actually in her 30s when she went back to school. And she went to Queens College. She participated in the SEEK program. And she did it at a time when folks like Audre Lord, when Audrey and Rich, when Barbara Christian were teachers in the SEEK program. They didn't teach McKay, but they were, they were teachers in the program. So that gives you a sense of the atmosphere, you know, what it was like to be a part of SEEK at a time when you had these graduate students and these teachers who said, you know, we want to affirm what our Black and Puerto Rican students are bringing to the table. We want to make sure that the literature speaks to them, that they know that they have a voice and a place within this classroom. So there was a whole lot of transformative pedagogy going on back then. We talk about inclusive pedagogies now, but there is a long, long history of that. So McKay becomes a college student in her 30s and then actually ends up at Harvard when she is about 39 years old. And, you know, her trajectory, I think, you know, it's a lot of good luck and good fortune, not to mention hard work and being in the right place at the right time. She had a professor um, who asked her where she was applying to graduate school. And she rattled off all of the New York schools, you know, NYU and Columbia. He said, well, you know, what other schools are you applying to? Aren't you looking outside of New York? And she's a native New Yorker and she's thinking to herself, no, I'm not thinking outside of New York City. Um, but then she comes back and she says, okay, well, I'll fix his wagon. I'm going to apply to Harvard and Yale and Princeton. So she just names all of these Ivies. Mm -hmm. And then she gets into Harvard 
And it so happens that her daughter gets into Harvard as well. And so the two of them end up at Harvard, essentially as sisters. And this marks the beginning of not only her graduate career, but also how she bifurcated her professional and personal path so that folks would focus on her achievements and not necessarily what she had done prior, not her personal life, but her professional achievements instead. So um, yeah, that was how she ended up at Harvard. And then of course, over time, um, finally at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But it was, um, I think in many ways, her focus on what she could contribute as a scholar of Black literature and culture um, and not allowing stereotypes uh, about um, Black women emasculating men professionally. Remember, this is all kind of one yeah. hand is in the backdrop. And Black women, you know, the failures of the Black family are being placed at the feet of, you know, ambitious Black women, the so-called matriarchal structure. Um, and I think her decision to put aside information about um, her family and her life prior to arriving at Harvard was um, in large part because of the atmosphere of the time and her goal to focus on her achievements. You talk, to, you talk about uh, Nellie McKay really coming into uh, into her scholarly self uh, at the you know, at Harvard uh, during graduate school, but uh, also at eventually at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, a university she stays at her entire professional career. Um, can you discuss a bit about Nellie McKay, the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison professor, um, how she becomes really this uh, world historical figure? Uh, out at this state university in Madison, Wisconsin. And she's doing, building not only African-American studies, she's really uh, building African-American literary studies. Yeah, and this is crucial. I know I'm competing with a very little dog with a very big <laughs> voice. I have closed all the blinds. I thought I prevented this, but we'll just keep it pushing. Um, right. So in terms of her intellectual project, especially what she was able to accomplish at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, you know, I think it's easy to take for granted um, the presence of Black women's literature on um, high school reading lists, on syllabi, but that was not the case at all. And a lot of her intellectual project had to do not just with reclaiming the literature of Black women, but also teaching the literature of Black women and publishing essays and articles that would help to unpack the strategies and signs and symbols used in Black women's literature. So this intellectual project that had to do with first and foremost, the achievements of Black women scholars, but ultimately with African-American literary studies was really, it really came down to her work with the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature. Corey, if I may, I'm not sure when this dog is going to stop. I'm <laughs> going to scoop him up and I'm going to bring him over so that we can continue. Give me just a moment. Yeah, bring the more the merrier. <laughs> okay, I was muted. I was video off, but not <laughs> muted. So, um, yeah, the intellectual project related to McKay's work on the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature. So um, when I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I took courses in African-American literature, we were reading, it was kind of piecemeal. So you had books 
the idea was how do you find the books? How do you piece together this tradition? How are you going to cobble together all of the sources that you need? Because the books weren't necessarily in print. There were photocopies circulated of several texts. But the work of the Norton Anthology, um, it functioned two ways. First of all, the Norton was a premier teaching tool. So the idea was that if we are going to establish a black literary canon, and I know that that is a contested term, um, but at the time the idea was, there was a lot of, so many conversations about canon formation, but there was also thought that, you know, before we start to deconstruct and critique um, a canon of African-American literature, let's take the time and effort to first establish it. Um, and so it was about establishing the canon, but also providing access. Now, when the Norton was first underway, there were no Black women on the editorial board. And Mary Helen Washington, who had been called on to advise, um, to serve as uh, in an advisory capacity, noticed this and pulled out. Um, and ultimately McKay took her place. And I bring this up because there's a direct connection to McKay's focus on Black women in her individual scholarship and the contributions that she was able to make to the Norton as co-editor. Not only were there women who were partnered in all of, um, as period editors for the Norton, but you had Black women woven into the fabric of a Black literary tradition. So McKay's, I think, you know, her intellectual project certainly has to do with recovery and contributions to Black feminist thought, but the institutionalization of Black literary studies um, was really propelled forward by the Norton. This is not to in any way um, shade other anthologies that were coming out at the time. But the anthologizing of Black literature usually took place when there were, you know, maybe just a, a couple folks. Um, I'm thinking about um, the Ken Kinnaman, um, the Ken Kinnaman anthology. I'm also thinking about, um, and I can't remember the title, there was another one that was published just shortly before the Norton, but these typically had, you know, there were two co-editors. Part of what made the Norton Anthology of African American Literature groundbreaking was the fact that it pulled together stars in a wide variety of fields to collaborate together around this huge inch, I mean, several inches thick anthology um, of a tradition. And so um, I think her, her contributions were certainly to scholarship, but she was thinking long-term. What do we need to do to make sure that no one can ever say that they can't access? Well, first of all, that there's no black literary tradition because that was actually on the table. There's no tradition, there's nothing to recover, when in fact they had too much and they went over the original page estimate. Um, so no one could ever say that the tradition didn't exist and no one could ever say that they can't find materials to teach it. So she and Henry Louis Gates Jr. who were co-editors along with the period editors worked together, collaborated over many, many years to make sure that um, that Black literary studies would be here to stay. I was thinking of the, just looking on the bookshelf at the Negro Caravan and thinking of that, that classic collection uh, published out of Howard University Press. And then of course, when Norton comes, I mean, it is, it is truly a, a published publication event. And mm -hmm. it's part of that era where you get, you know, the, the Harvard Guide to African-American History, uh, the biographies uh, that uh, Henry Louis Gates and um, El Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham edited, the Black biographies that really then begin Encyclopedia Africana that Gates mm -hmm. and uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah put out. I mean, this is this moment of 
I mean, canon formation. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's a contested idea, but it really is what's going on at that moment. And Nellie is is Nellie uh, Juan McKay is right at the center of it, and not just um, you know ancillary, but really shaping what that intellectual project looks like um, and building uh, that legacy. I want to go back to that idea about narrating her mother. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you talked about that with how Nellie uh, narrates uh, her, mo uh, her mother. Um, this, this text, uh, we, and we talked about this, this text mm -hmm. is part of that literary tradition uh, of African-American biography and autobiography. And we were talking about Toni Morrison's uh, famed essay in, in, in the early 1980s rootedness, the ancestor as foundation, um, how we begin to look at this particular form. How did you, you know, given the way in which Nellie not only narrated her life, but narrates her mother's life, how did you find the way, a voice to narrate Nellie's life? Trial and error. <laughs> I, so, I can't tell you how many times I started and stopped this book. Um, and what I realized was that I was really, I was in search of two things. First, um, my voice as a writer within this context, but also um, the specific story that I wanted to tell. Now, as you know, there can be multiple biographies of a single of, of a single figure. So, you know, whether we're talking about Lorraine Hans, you know, Lorraine Hansberry is probably one of the most recent examples. Um, so you could Koibert, um, Imani Perry, of course, um, you have different biographers who approach the archive through their individual through an individual lens and so the story that they tell is going to be based on their particular investments their preoccupations um whatever it is that is driving their intention and so it took a while for me to figure out what story i wanted to tell once i told the story behind um you know her early years her family, I really had to think, okay, well, who am I writing to? And that was one of the primary ways that I came to write the book, that I came to find this voice, is that I thought about myself writing to young Black women scholars to basically say, you know, your place here has been bought and paid for that there is a history that exists where you don't need to justify your right to take up space in the academy. And telling Nellie's story, figuring out the story that I wanted to tell, which was ultimately the story of the rise of African-American literary studies through her life, but also the story of the integration of Black women into black women scholars into higher education, predominantly white institutions. I need to say that also because black women had been teaching at HBCUs. So this is about predominantly white colleges and universities. So, you know, those, the revision process and sharing and sharing often and having um, really a team of peers and colleagues who would give me feedback. Um, one of the things that I did, I realized that I needed to have my voice present in a particular way. So there are autobiographical vignettes that are interspersed throughout the, um, throughout the narrative because I realized that there were experiences that I was talking about with McKay's life but I also wanted to make clear that um, as much as our space in the American Academy has been bought and paid for, 
there are still struggles that cut across time and place. And I wanted to serve, I wanted my life to serve as a counterpoint to hers, but to also offer a point of entry for those who may not know very much about McKay, but who may already find themselves struggling to find a place in, um, in the academy, in their department, at their respective institutions. So yeah, those were the ways that I was thinking primarily about how to develop this voice and um, how to tell this story of my place in this kind of genealogy in this family tree of Black literary studies. You end the text uh, with reflections on how um, Nellie uh, Juan McKay is remembered uh, throughout the you know, throughout the profession, but most importantly at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And in this moment where universities are confronting uh, their past and looking at the questions around the politics of memory at the university. It's University of Wisconsin-Madison places Nellie at the very center, her intellectual practice and work at the center of its identity. Can you talk a bit about what that means, not only for the memory of, of Nellie Juan McKay, but also what does that mean for African-American literary studies and even for the university, particularly predominantly white institutions, as they shift the center of focus of the very the intellectual vocation of the institution. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, these days, the way that institutions talk about that very topic is through the language of belonging. So we've moved from, you know, including and accommodating to this language of belonging, which for me is about um, a right to take up space and to have your experience be center, uh, be centered and not peripheral. So when it comes to how McKay has been memorialized, I think back to the letters that I read where she talked about the loneliness of being at the University of Wisconsin, um, being this single black woman out in the Midwest, how was she going to figure out, um, how was she going to negotiate being in um, Afro-American studies? How was she going to negotiate her relationship with the English department? And she was lonely a lot of the time. She maintained a correspondence with um, Nell Irvin Painter for nearly 30 years. And it was just crucial, um, their relationship and their connection because it was care work that was going on between them. There was mentoring, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, all kinds of things. But it was also, I think the way we might phrase it today is, you know, it was care work, being invested in the thoughts of one another when their colleagues may have looked askance at their intellectual interests. So if we think about this, these feelings of loneliness and alienation, this idea of taking up, taking up space and assuming a place within the institution is crucial. So I would say for undergraduates, there is, um, you know, there's a floor in a residence hall that's dedicated and named after Nellie McKay. And so I think about, you know, just the living arrangements and to have a space where her name is lifted up and where I hope um, there is something in the programming that lets them know that it's named after a professor who not only dedicated her career to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but also loved her students dearly. Then there is the intellectual space because there is um, a lecture named after McKay. And also, oh goodness, um, as I recall, there is something related to Lorraine Hansberry. There are ways that Afro-American studies has seen fit 
to make sure that McKay is memorialized. And, you know, you and I were talking about the fact that there are a lot of folks now who are getting their flowers before they pass, that yeah. there are symposia celebrating scholars for their contributions, for their work with students. So we get to see these genealogies of influence when you have someone's students and the students that they taught, individuals who have taken up um, the research and extended the work of a particular scholar of note. And so I see the University of Wisconsin thinking about her impact, not just intellectually, not just in terms of her scholarship, but also in terms of the lived experiences of the students who are looking to belong at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I wanna uh, sort of, uh, as we move to a close, you are now part of the faculty here at, at Wake Forest University, and we're so excited, but this text in a sense places you within a unique intellectual genealogy here. Um, writing this biography, that, you know, that, that form of biography, autobiography that Morrison talks about in, the, in that rootedness essay, um, we're about to name, uh, we're, we've named the street after uh, Dolly McPherson, the first African-American uh, woman uh, professor here uh, who joined in 74 along with Herman Urey. But her work looked at the autobiographical works of uh, Maya Angelou, who really, that, that the autobiography as form, um, the, 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 that genre, you enter into this conversation with biography as form and building on this intellectual legacy. Can you talk a bit about that and what it means to contribute to African-American literary studies through this unique genre that mm -hmm. you next month will find out uh, if you won that Hearst and Wright Award uh, that we're all rooting for you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think about the form, but I also think about the philosophies of those who kind of, um, you know, that you ref that you referenced, who work within the form. Um, when I was small, my mother took us to see um, Maya Angelou speak, and it was a reading, and she took a picture with my younger brother. And there was this idea that her work, her literature, her being there, that he was a part of that, that there was access and it was for everyone. And so when I think about my approach to autobiography and biography, I want to figure out a way of widening these gates of access so that folks who might not have imagined themselves interested in the life of someone who wrote these books and wrote these essays and taught these classes and you know organized symposia and you know did all the anthologizing whether or not they kind of imagine themselves as part of that world that there is something that's cross-cutting about the human condition and that there is something that we all have that we strive to do, that we yearn to do. And there are costs, there are trade-offs, there are choices that we make in order to make our dreams a reality. And so when I think about the genre itself, I think about how we open up our stories and the stories of other people so that as wide an audience of, as possible can have access and perhaps have some sort of affirmation or new way of thinking of their own place in the world. Shana, thank you so much uh, for this conversation. And before we go, I want to, you're, you're new to Wake Forest. Um, you're not only sharing this great scholarship and research, you're also opening, uh, our, opening up our students to new avenues uh, of, of scholarship through your teaching. 
talk to us a bit about the new classes that you're teaching this semester here at Wake Forest. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, so one of those classes is inspired by my book and I'm teaching a course on black feminist theory and I'm using the lens um, of black women's literature. I'm looking at the literary origins of black feminist theory. So we're reading works like um, The Color Purple. We're reading Their Eyes Were Watching God. We're reading um, For Colored Girls. So we're reading a wide variety of texts that were highly contested at the time. You know, great deal of backlash against black women writers who were supposedly ex uh, exposing, you know, the dirty laundry of the black community when in fact, they were just centering the lives and experiences of black women and girls. So we're using that as a way of talking about contemporary issues around black feminist thought. So we're trying to bridge the gap. Mickey Kendall's Hood Feminism was the first text we read. And so that gave them a broad sense of the field. And then we go backwards and say, so how does a book like The Color Purple anticipate the concerns of um, around women and girls that Mickey Kendall gets at in the book? So that's one of the courses I'm teaching. And the other course that I'm teaching is a course on Black motherhood. And that course is really, um, it's a difficult course to teach because the, the material and the history is, um, you know, sometimes difficult to face, but we're doing Dorothy Roberts, Killing the Black Body. We just read Beloved. And so we're thinking not just about um, this legacy of the painting of Black motherhood and pregnancy is in some way deviant, but also finding the ways that Black women express joy as mothers and find community in elevating their children. So those are the two classes that I'm teaching and I just can't wait to continue to build upon what, um, what those classes are doing. Also with in mind, um, the needs and the desires of the students at present. Shanna, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for all that you uh, brought to Wake Forest and, of course, everything that's going to that's coming. Um, it's really an exciting time uh, to be here. I'm so uh, grateful that you're my dear colleague and so grateful you joined our community. I want to thank our dear friends at the in FUBA, the Association of Wake Forest University Black Alumni, for co-sponsoring today's uh, homecoming lecture. Um, we're so excited to be in partnership with you. We truly appreciate the support of our Black alumni and alumni uh, throughout Wake Forest for everything that they've done uh, to not only support the program, but really uh, for over half a century, uh, set, the found, set the ground uh, for this program to come to the university and really uh, make the impact that it has made. So I want to thank all of the folks at AFUBA. And as you come to campus, please come visit us. Uh, we're both, uh, Shana and I are both located in uh, Tribble Hall, uh, that wonderful maze on the campus of Wake Forest University uh, that all of you are aware, aware of. Uh, we want to welcome, welcome you to come in and join us. And we want you to also join our programming uh, coming up throughout the years. Pay attention to our website, uh, afam.wfu.edu. Follow us on Twitter uh, at WFU FM Studies. Uh, and also you can follow our programming uh, on, on our YouTube channel, the Wake Forest African American Studies YouTube channel. So on behalf of almost 30 faculty, collaborating faculty in African-American studies at the university. Uh, I wanna thank each of you for joining us uh, for today's homecoming lecture. And I wish all of you a wonderful homecoming and we look forward to welcoming you back to campus. Go Deeks. <laughs>